what am I doing here? Oh, okay, that's you. Meeting is live streamed. Yep. So okay. good. Got it. Good gentlemen, we are coming to you live right now. <clears throat> I'm here with Patrick O'Kelly. Um, as we were just discussing beforehand, uh, says the when we talk about the Revolutionary War in the South, um, he is definitely one of those guys whose books you've probably referenced as a uh, as a resource. Um, his books, uh, Nothing But Blood and Slaughter, uh, cover as four volumes covers pretty much every single engagement uh, uh, during the Revolutionary War in the South. There. Um, it's a, a fantastic resource, um, and uh, but we're really glad you're joining us tonight, Patrick. Um, if you want to give us a little, uh, maybe a background on, yeah, who you are and how you got into uh, into studying the Revolutionary War in the South. All right, uh, the, who I am is, uh, like you said, Patrick O'Kelly, but uh, my background is I, I did 20 years in the military. I was one of those guys that did all the action guy stuff. I started out in the 82nd Airborne, went to war in Grenada. I was a sniper, went to the Rangers, started the 3rd Ranger Battalion, uh, went to 5th Special Forces, then 3rd Special Forces, Desert Storm, or operate behind enemy lines. So I did all this, and it actually ties into that, how I got into the Rev War books. Uh, besides being in the Army, I was one of those guys that did reenacting. And so I reenacted at about the same time I joined the Army. So I started reenacting in 1979. And so I did all these reenactments and all of a sudden I was doing one of the final missions I did was I was supporting a special forces team in Fort Polk, Louisiana. And uh, while I was there, I, I, my job was I had to pretend I was like the supply element. So in other words, I, I guess we were low budget or something. We couldn't afford planes. So what I would do is I'd drive out the drops of a push a bunch of you know, MREs or something on the ground or a bunch of ammo and then drive away. It's like, Oh, I'm an aerial resupply. And every time they needed help or, or something, I was the guy who would go in and help them out. And they were doing a bigger mission, but I was just a little tiny supply element for this team. So not a problem. In between that, though, I was I had a lot of time off. I was in a hotel sitting in, outside Fort Polk, Louisiana, and there ain't nothing there. And so I said, OK, I'm, I'm going to go to the library. I'm going to go check out what's in the library. And I found one little teeny weeny thin book. It was a book written in Bicentennial about the wars in the South and uh, the battles in the South during the Revolutionary War. And it listed like 12. Now, I had been reenacting all those years and I, I knew, hold it, there's a bunch of stuff, really big things that's not in there. Why aren't they in there? And so I started trying to look around, uh, you know, after this mission, I looked around trying to find stuff. But I didn't find anything. So I told a buddy of mine, you know what? I'm going to write about it. I'm going to write about all these battles that nobody knows about. And I'll probably get it done in six months. It took me five years, five years tracking down all these battles because I didn't just want to rehash what old historians wrote. I went into the archives and first person accounts and everything else. And I found new things that nobody had heard of. And also I wrote all these and it couldn't get in one volume. It, it, it spread, it kept getting bigger and bigger. I think the actual page amount, if you add all four volumes together, is something like 2000 pages. And uh, it, I ended up listing 950-odd battles and skirmishes between the two Carolinas. And I also had to include the Savannah River region of Georgia because it was, it was important. So the two Carolinas and the one little strip of the Savannah River region of Georgia, everything that happened. And that all came about because I was stuck on a mission, had nothing better to do, and went to a library in Fort Polk, Louisiana. Louisiana. And, uh, and so... The rest is history. And on the other thing, the second book, or I should say the other book, is I had Francis Marion's uh, uh, orderly book. It was transcripts. And I always wondered, why hasn't anybody wrote about this? And nobody did. So finally, I said, if no one else is going to do it, I'll do it. So I transcribed every single part of his orderly book. And so that's another one of my books. Uh, it's it's called... Uh, <laughs> Oh, you know what my books are called because it had a name change recently because I didn't like the name. I changed it. Uh, oh, it's good. Uh, it's Be Cool and Do Mischief, but it's Francis Marion's orderly book. And so that's I've got four books. That's nothing but blood and water. And I got the one book that's Francis Marion. And uh, and that, there's a whole nother book about me, what I did during the military. But that's that, that's a whole different subject. 
Wow, that's great. Yeah, no, like I said, uh, when we were writing about uh, both myself and Rob Worson writing books on the war uh, recently in South Carolina, those books came in very handy. I mean, if anybody <clears throat> doesn't have a copy of them, you should definitely check them out. They got, uh, uh, yeah, in-depth uh, orders of battles. And, and you, like you said, you're covering everything from the big battles, but then also these, you know, where it's just a couple guys taking a couple pot shots at another guy. Oh, yeah, yeah. And because yeah. if it was significant, it actually mattered. You know, yeah. if one guy kills the other guy who's the leader of a whole element in a, an area, hey, that's something that matters, you know? And I think I think the title gets across, you know, when you say nothing but blood and slaughter, really, you get a sense of just how bloody the war was uh, in the South during this time period. And um, Well, that, that, that title came from General Green. When General Green came and assumed the army, this is after the Battle of Camden. So he arrives and he just realizes like, holy crap, what have I stepped into? It were about the best comparison would be an American commander setting the middle of Afghanistan and all the tribal warfare. And he has to figure out how do I win this? And how do I, how do I succeed? And it's all tribal warfare. They all hate each other. It's not really, you know, Americans versus Afghans. It's, it's tribes versus each other. And, they, it, and there's blood feuds and just, you know, that goes back forever. So he walks in the middle of all this blood feuds and green said, that the the whole area of North Carolina is nothing but blood and slaughter, and it will continue to be that until they, you know, it, until the end. And so I said, that's a great title for a book, and I'll use that. <laughs> now it is a great title, um, and, it, and it, it ties in perfectly. So one of the things we want to talk about tonight is uh, something that, like we said, uh, nobody really knows much about. Not much has been written about, and uh, <clears throat> the. The, the Tory War uh, that breaks out in 1781 in, in North Carolina. Um, so, yeah, we're talking about North Carolina. Um, you know, I think people may be familiar that there's a, a small battle at the beginning of the war in 1776, Battle <clears throat> Bridge, uh, where there was a lot of loyalists versus uh, patriots or Whigs versus Tories. And, and basically what happens after that, uh, after that battle in North Carolina and, and, and what's going on from 1776 up until, you know, when this is all happening in 1781. Yeah, this is, I'm going to try to do a synopsis and I'm going to try and keep it under 15 minutes, which we'll see. Uh, all right. What happened was North Carolina, uh, the British weren't doing real well. I mean, they, 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 they left Boston and they're trying to figure out, okay, we got to get a foothold here. How are we going to win this war? And they knew that down in the Carolinas, there was a huge element of people that were for the king. Now, where that comes from, there was a little known war before the Revolutionary War, four years before. It's called the Regulator War. And a recent, I, I, let's, that's kind of interesting is a modern culture, pop culture, it, it, all of a sudden Regulator War pops up on everybody's radar because yeah. of... <laughs> oh man, I can't name it. That's what's the name of the show? Outlander. <laughs> there you go, Outlander. So all of a sudden, people know what the regular war is. It's like, oh, oh, interesting. But the regular war was basically uh, the interior of North Carolina wasn't getting any infrastructure. All their tax money was going to the eastern colonies or eastern counties, and uh, they were blowing it on stupid things. Like, a, you know, the guy was Governor Tryon. He built a, a lavish palace and and decides he's going to blow us some money out. meanwhile out in the west they don't have sheriffs they don't have law they don't have nothing and so they're basically being ignored and most of the people out in the western counties are scottish irish and german uh, that are all there and so it's almost like uh there's a there's a, a colony there where it's bias and because they don't like the irish they don't like the scottish and this is after you know the whole battle of culloden so the brits really don't give a crap what happens to the scottish well, all of a sudden, people out west say, you know what? We're not going to pay any taxes anymore. We're not going to do it. And so Tryon is losing control. He marches out there. They fight one battle, Battle of Alamance. The entire Battle of Alamance lasts like 20 minutes. And what it is, it's a trained force versus a non-trained force. And the untrained force was the Scottish and Irish and stuff like that. And they lose. Now, at the end of that, what happens is they have to make a choice. The choice is... You can leave or you can stay. But if you stay, you have to sign a loyalty oath to the king. And if the king ever needs your help, you will come you know, and fight for him. So all these people, 
now all these loyalists is a huge factor that the British remember. Like these guys are down there. They'll fight for us. Now, a lot, some people say the Regulator War was part of the Revolutionary War. No, it wasn't. It had nothing to do with the Revolutionary War. It was an internal thing with, within North Carolina alone. But the outcome of the Regulator War decided who you would fight for. And it really had nothing to do with King. They didn't give a crap about the King. What they cared about was revenge. The people in the Western counties lost, and they wanted to stick it to the people in the Eastern counties. Uh, you know, think of think of something that happened in our life four years ago politically that people still have a, a you know a little, little bit of a pain about. So four years later, they're still kind of don't like the other side, the other political side. And so what they do is they when the British come to them and say, "Hey, we want you to rise up," they're loyal. So like, heck yeah, we're in. And so they rise up. The British actually have a pretty good plan, three prong plan. Number one. The Loyalists rise up, march toward Wilmington at the same time to keep the Western colonies. I'm talking about like far Western colonies, which are more patriot than Loyalist. The far Western colonies, they told the Cherokee, we want you to rise up and attack. If you do, you know, we win. You get, uh, you know, we'll honor the agreement where nobody's going to mess with your land. The Cherokees are like, OK, we're in. So the British, the third part of the plan was the British are going to land in Wilmington with their Royal Navy and a whole force. The problem happened with the Loyalists. They got antsy and they started losing people. And so the guy in charge said, he's got to do something or he's going to lose his army. So he starts early, marches toward Wilmington. Well, the British hadn't landed yet. And so what happened was the Americans were able to gather their forces and stop the Loyalist Army, and uh, it's called the Battle of Moore Street Bridge. It really isn't a battle. It's basically one shot. When it was one heck of a shot. It was like everybody firing one giant volley in the face of the Loyalists as they're trying to cross a bridge. Kills like 75 in the first blast. The rest run away, and that's it. That's the Battle of, of Moore Street Bridge. And I know some of the, the fanciful paintings has the Highlanders wearing kilts and playing bagpipes. That crap never happened. Nobody had a kilt. Nobody had a bagpipe. It was a middle of the night trying to cross a bridge, trying to do it in a sneaky way, and they don't, they get slaughtered. Now, because of that, the Loyalists don't rise up again for, for almost four years until this thing called the Tory War we're going to talk about. Oh, the Indians also got screwed over. The Indians rose up. Well, because the British hadn't landed yet, and the Loyalists aren't there anymore, pretty much everybody fights the Indians. There's even Loyalists that fight the Indians because it's white guys versus red guys, and nobody likes the red guys, so let's kill them all. And so the Indians basically get wiped and they, they get hurt so bad that they they're out they're not going to fight anymore Cherokees are out of the fight for the rest of the war except one little band under a guy called Dragging Canoe and they he formed a, a basically the warrior band of the Cherokee called the Chickamauga and he kept on fighting until the end of the war now the British when they show up they finally show up Wilmington hasn't fallen they can't really do anything so they're stuck outside of Wilmington trying to figure out what can we do how can we Get a foothold in the South, because that's where we're going to go. Well, they do some recon parties, and one of the recon parties finds way down there in Charleston, there's not much guarding Charleston. There's a new fort they're building, but it's made out of sand and palm trees. So let's take Charleston. So the British try to take Charleston. Now, the Royal Navy screwed up. They're kind of kind of like the Bunker Hill. The, the big reason the British lost the Battle of Bunker Hill was hubris. They thought they couldn't be defeated. We're going to march up that hill and they're going to go run away. And uh, guess what? That didn't work. Well, Charleston is like the Bunker Hill for the Royal Navy. They thought, we're not just going to sail in. We're going to park our ships right beside that little sand fort. And we're going to blast it to bits to show you can't stand up to the Royal Navy. Well, they do park their ships. And they're shooting in the fort. In the, short, the fort's made out of sand and palm trees. It soaks up all the cannonballs. Normally what kills you, sometimes it's the cannonball, but many times it's the fragments of the wood coming off from splinters and everything else. There are no splinters. It just soaks it up. I always, I always say it's like punching SpongeBob. You, know, you can punch them all you want. You ain't going to feel it. It just soaks it up. Meanwhile, inside the fort, these guys are laying waste to the Royal Navy. Every time they fire, the cannons are being aimed like almost like sniper rifles, and they're taking out all the all the guys on the quarter deck, which are the officers. So almost every single officer was wounded or killed that fight. They sink uh, one ship. I mean, it's it's a slaughter. 
So because of that, the British aren't able to get to Charleston and then back off. They have to come up with a new plan. The new plan, the war moves back up north. They decide to go take New York City. And so that opens up the whole campaign up north. So nothing happens in the south for a while. That's 1776. So nothing happens in the south all the way until about 79. And what happens is Florida. Florida was still loyalist, still British. And everybody, you know, all the all the, the, the loyalists who lost and, you know, they, they didn't want to be in North Carolina or South Carolina anymore, they moved down to Florida. So in Florida, you got a British garrison and you got loyalists and they're doing these cattle raids into Georgia. And they keep going farther and farther in Georgia. And finally, they realize, holy cow, we almost made it all the way to Savannah before somebody stopped us. So they tell the Brits, like, Savannah's wide open. You might be able to take Savannah. And so the British decide to do that because they're still trying to get a foothold in the South, make it a two front war. So the Americans have to fight two different directions. Well, they get Savannah. They take Savannah easily. They march right in with very little, little fight, take it and start fortifying it. Now, what happens next is uh, it's kind of like the Pickett's charge of the Revolutionary War. And it's the bloodiest battle of the French and Americans combined of the war. But again, you hardly ever hear about it because it happens down south. There's a whole bias there, and I'll talk about the bias in a few minutes. But basically, what happened was the Americans are able to convince the French, who are roaming around the Caribbean, snatching up islands like they're, they're you know, like they, as fast as they can, because they know if we can get them, we can, you know, keep them. And so the British aren't defending them much because the British are everywhere else. So they're snatching up all these islands and the Americans convince them, why don't you come up and help us take Savannah back? So the French do arrive, the French start reinforcing. It's this massive army, but they also screw up. The French, uh, they keep delaying taking the city and actually give the city a chance to fortify it even more until the point they couldn't take it without a massive loss. So they're stuck outside Savannah for about, oh, about a month. Finally, they decide to do an attack, and even the attack goes wrong because they're supposed to attack at nighttime and punch one little area. It's called Spring Hill Redoubt, and punch through that area and take the city. It was a good plan, but the French screwed that up. The French argued about who gets to go first, point of honor, and by the time they put screwing around, it's daylight. The Brits know they're coming. They've reinforced Spring Hill Redoubt, and they do the charge, and so they march at it, and like I said, it's the Pickett's Charge of the South. The French get slaughtered. The Americans who check it get slaughtered. There's like hundreds of killed, wounded, dead. I mean, it's it's a massive slaughter. Well, Americans, the French leave. It's like, all right, we're gone. We're going to go back doing something down in the Caribbean. So the Americans have to back off to Charleston. But now the Brits realize, holy crap, we've hurt them so bad. We might be able to take Charleston. And so they convince the, the, the overall plan is to bring the British south again. And the British leave uh, from where uh, you know, a good portion of them from New York, sail south. They get some other troops from Ireland. They get some other troops from elsewhere and they attack and they're able to capture Charleston. And Charleston is the largest defeat in U.S. American history until World War II when uh, uh, you know the Philippines were lost because it was a massive loss. You lost an entire Southern Continental Army. You lost over 350 cannons because Charleston was one of the most heavily defended places on earth. So you lose all that. And the British now have that. And they realize, all right, we got the Americans on a two front war. We might actually win this thing now. And the guy overall in charge of the, 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 uh, the British forces, he tells Cornwallis, his second in command, or the guy, you're in charge now. All you have to do is subdue the South Carolina. Don't go into North Carolina. Leave that alone. Just subdue South Carolina get them to take the king's peace and everything will be great. And that actually works for a little while. And then I always said that if I was write another book, I'd call it the man who lost the war. One man lost the war. Cause right at this point in history, there are talks where the Americans are seriously talking about giving up. Uh, there was articles in various British magazines about the, 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 the plan. And the plan was the, if I can remember correctly, the British would keep South Carolina, the Americans would keep like the middle area, 
and 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 doing the state. So basically what would happen is the United States would consist of New England, a British area, and then Florida and South Carolina. I'm going to Florida South Carolina, a British area. So you'd have America in between two British colony areas. And they were seriously thinking about that. Then one guy came along. The guy that screwed it up for everybody, his name was Christian Huck. And Huck was riding with uh, Tarleton, uh, Bannister Tarleton. But Huck was a guy who just, he was, he was brutal. He was barbaric. Uh, he, he was told, get these guys to take the peace, you know, make them sign the king's loyalty. But when he rode out, he, right off the bat, he did things that totally angered the, the locals. Uh, for one thing, he rode out and he, and he, there was a guy that was bad mouthing him, a sheriff. Well, he found this guy that he thought was the sheriff. He draws and quarters the guy. I mean, we're talking medieval stuff here, you know, four pieces. He puts the four pieces of the guy on the four corners of, of the road so everybody knows that he did it. But it wasn't the sheriff, it was the sheriff's brother. Then as he's riding along, he, he doesn't like Presbyterian churches. And because Presbyterian is a Scottish religion. And so he, Bad mouth the Presbyterians all the time. The fact that one time he told them, you know, even if Jesus Christ himself was on your side, you won't be able to beat us because we're the British Army. Well, this angers everybody. And then he does something stupid. He burns down a few churches and he kills a, a, a basically mentally disabled kid holding a Bible, shoots right through the Bible, kills the kid. His name was William Strong. Well, all the people in the area now hate this guy. And because he also said that you couldn't beat me even with Jesus Christ on our side, this is in a period of time. It's called the Presbyterian Rebellion or the Presbyterian War. It was a jihad. It was a holy jihad all across everywhere. People rose up with guns and decided to kill this guy, this Christian Huck. And they surround his camp at about one o'clock in the morning in uh, Brattonsville, South Carolina, and they slaughter him. Now, this does one thing. One thing is all of a sudden people realize, hey, the British aren't that invincible. We just defeated this guy. And so more and more people rise up and they join this army across the border of North Carolina under a guy called William Sumter. And William Sumter marches south and starts conquering these British outposts. Now, as he's doing that, Cornwallis now has a problem. And the problem is he has to put down this new rebellion that's going on, this Presbyterian rebellion. Everything was kind of peaceful, but all of a sudden everything's falling apart. So as Sumter is putting down all these posts up north, he links up with a new American commander who marched down from up north. Because remember, the American Continental Army had been captured at Charleston, but a new one is being created. And the guy who marches from up north is Horatio Gates. And so Gates shows up and he has to figure out, okay, how do I keep the British from going into North Carolina? Gates's plan is actually a pretty good plan. What he was going to do was he was going to cut off the British from reinforcing those outposts that Sumter was capturing. And it was a one, one area you could do it. It was called Gum Swamp. It was a swamp north of Camden. Well, he marches to the Gum Swamp area so he could seize those that, 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 that it's basically like a little, for lack of a better word, bridge, even though that's kind of being a nice by calling it a bridge. But basically, it's one area where an army has to cross. So I'm going to put troops there so he can't cross. Now, as he marches, he has to make a decision. And the decision is he has to make a, a more direct march so he can intercept this one Patriot militia army that he has to get before they attack Cornwallis. Because if they attack Cornwallis, he knows they'll get lost, they'll get beat, and they'll disperse. And he'll lose a, about a quarter of his army that he could have. So a lot of people say Gates was stupid for the march he did. But you got to realize he had to do it because he's trying to intercept this, this whole army under a guy called Ash to, to stop them from attacking the British. So Gates, he ends up moving in a bad way. His army is starving. It's, there's hardly any food. By the time they get to Gum Swamp at 1 o'clock in the morning, they bump into something. And they don't know what they bumped into. They just know it might be a British recon force or something. But they fired up. And they don't always, so they back off and wait. And they say, okay, I'll just put my men in line of battle and fight them. Now, what he doesn't know, that force he bumped into that might be a British recon force was Cornwallis and the entire British Army. Because they had marched north out of Camden to basically find that militia army that was running around under Ash. 
what happens next is the Battle of Camden. The Battle of Camden is the Gates is defeated for a second time. The entire Continental Army is wiped out, not dead. It's mainly just disbanded, captured, run away. Uh, one of the a real interesting things that happened then is right before the battle happened, Francis Marion shows up. And Francis Marion is a guy who was a really good conventional unit commander. Uh, he was one of the guys who was, who was in the fort at Fort uh, uh, Sullivan when the British attacked in 1776. And so he's a really good commander, but he's also a Huguenot. Huguenots are kind of like Puritans, uh, French Puritans. They don't drink, things like that. Well, when the British had surrounded Charleston, the Americans were basically having these go to hell parties where kind of like a hurricane party down here where everything's about to go to hell. So let's get drunk and stupid. Well, they would bring all the officers in and say, here, you're going to drink and nobody can leave the house. So all the liquor in this house is, is drunk up. Well, they tricked Marion into one, Marion into one of these parties. Well, he shows up and he says, oh, you got to get drunk and you can't leave until all the booze is out of the house. And, Marion's like, no, I'm not going to play this stupid game. I got, I got more important things to worry about. And I don't drink. Well, they wouldn't let him out. So he goes up to the second floor and he jumps out. When he jumps out, he lands on his ankle and he snaps it in half. Bad. Now it may, you know, everything, a little bit of karma here. Everything happens for a reason is uh, because he got, he was now out. He couldn't walk. He is evacuated out of Charleston before it falls. So you got one of the best commanders in South Carolina on the loose he rides into gates's army before gates get captured before the battle of camden and uh he rides into gates's arm uh, uh camp and offers his services well, gates sees this little short old long-nosed looking french guy with a limp he said he rides in with like half a dozen guys half of them are black half of them are white because the southern army is pretty integrated but they weren't all slaves either there was a bunch of free but it was integrated it was all sorts of colors and so he looks at these guys and he they look like the pirates of Penzance. He's like, what, what good are you for me? So he says, Hey, why don't you just go East, organize that militia out there and, and have them do something to help the war effort. Well, Marion ends up going out, taking over the Williams, uh, William, yeah, Williamsburg County militia and ends up being, you know, one of the greatest guerrilla fighters of revolutionary war. Mar you know, the, the swamp Fox, even though nobody ever called him the swamp Fox while he was alive. That's something that was made up later on. But uh, uh, yeah, he, he does that. Now, eventually we're going to get to the Tory War. I swear to God. Maricel is going to try and do this in 15 minutes. Ha ha. Right. Southern, in the Southern campaign for sure. <laughs> oh yeah, I'm trying to do it. It's short. You really can't do it. It's not that short. Yeah. But anyway, so Cornwallis now has to figure out, okay, I, I've got, I think I'm going to go take out the main supply area of the Continental Army where Gates ran, and that's in North Carolina. It's in Charlotte. Now, remember, uh, 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 Cornwallis was told by his boss, don't go into North Carolina, but he decides to go in North Carolina. Well, he goes into Charlotte, but right about that time, they get hit with yellow fever. It's kind of nasty, and there's partisans, guerrillas everywhere. They're sniping him, reducing his ranks. Now, he, he you know, Cornwallis is a smart guy. He's not, uh, most caricatures of him portray him as like an idiot or something. No, he's not. He's a really squared away guy. Now he divides his army into three elements. He's going to send one commander to the east to, to basically put down any Patriot militia that might rise up over there. He's going to send another commander to the west. Basically keep those mountaineers out there that really haven't been in the war since they fought Cherokees. They don't really care. They're, they're in their own. Leave us alone. We leave you alone. He says, go out there and make sure those guys don't rise up. And then he goes into Charlotte. Now, when he goes into Charlotte, he meets uh, probably one of the most effective militia leaders, guerrilla leaders of the war. And he's really not known that much. And that's William Richardson Davy. Now, everybody had a nickname. Sumter was the Gamecock. And Marion was the Swamp Fox and blah, 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 blah. Davy didn't have a nickname. Davy was just scary. Davy was said to have killed more men with his sword than any officer of the war. And he wasn't like a brutal guy. He wasn't outspoken. He was a real mellow guy. But he reminds me of a modern Delta Force guy. If you if you ever actually met somebody from Delta, they don't really talk much. They're usually really mellow, subdued. But when you get them in a fight, they're scary, man. They will kill you. They No remorse, no passion. Just boom, boom, you're dead. Next guy, boom, boom, you're dead. And that was William Richardson Davy. So Davy, with 
150 guys stops uh, basically uh, uh, Cornwallis from from taking what's left of the Continental Army when when they withdrew from Camden. He's able to delay the British Army enough that they can get away. Now, while Cornwallis is in Charlotte, he's surrounded. And he really can't do much because of all the partisans. So he's mainly can't get the loyalists to rise up. The loyalists aren't going to rise up because last time they rose up, they got beat at uh, Moore's Creek Bridge. Now, something happens. The commander that he sent to the east to make sure those patriots don't rise up, he gets beat and his force gets slaughtered. The commander that he sent to the west to tell those backwoodsmen up there don't rise up, he's a, he does a stupid move. He does the same move that, that Huck did. He basically goes out there, can't get anybody to show up to take the king's loyalty. And he makes the comment that even if Jesus Christ was on your side, uh, he did that thing. He went all blasphemy. And all of a sudden, he also said that if you don't rise up, I will lay waste to your land with fire and sword and, and make, you know, widows of your of your wives and your children. All these backwoodsmen are like, these are like heavily armed rednecks. They're like, what? Excuse me? You don't walk into heavily armed redneck territory and tell them you're going to mess with them and their wives and their children. Basically, every heavily armed redneck for five states around showed up to get this guy. And yeah, this guy was uh, Ferguson. So Ferguson backs up to the only place he thinks he can get. He keeps asking Cornwallis, could you send me reinforcements? Cornwallis is like, no, I'm stuck in Charlotte. I can't do anything. So at Kings Mountain, Ferguson is surrounded and his army is captured, wiped out. One third of Cornwallis' army is now prisoners and they're being moved farther north out of his grasp. Now Cornwallis has to retreat back into South Carolina. He gets reinforcements and he decides, okay, I got to do this. But this time, probably the best commander in the American army, especially for the South, showed up. And that's Nathaniel Green. Nathaniel Green knew, I ain't got to beat Cornwallis. I just got to keep him wearing him down, a war of attrition, until he can't fight anymore. Because the Americans can keep getting men all they want. They've got a, you know, the supply pool is endless. You can get as much as you want. But the Brits don't have that. And the British now, because the French and the Spanish were fighting them, it's a world war. And so they, they don't have all the resources they had before. It's there. The battles are much smaller. The numbers are much smaller. And Nathaniel Green knows if I can just keep hitting them, they're not going to get their people and we'll be able to defeat them that way. A war of attrition. Now, Green comes up with a plan where he's going to send part of his army to the west to see if Cornwallis will go that way. And he's going to send part of his army to the east to see if Cornwallis will go that way. And then he's going to keep part of his army in the middle. So whatever Cornwallis does, I'm going to head into the North, South Carolina. And his goal was to basically take back Camden because Camden was a major supply base. Well, the army that heads out to the west is under Daniel Morgan. And Daniel Morgan's got what's left of the Continentals. It's not much. It's only six companies and a bunch of militia. Well, Cornwallis sends his most effective cavalry commander, Bannister Talton. And Talton's a very squared away commander. I know he's got a bad rap over the years, but he's very squared away. Now, what happens is, uh, trying to short this up, Cornwallis, I mean, uh, Talton and, and Morgan fight at Cowpens. Cowpens is probably the most perfect battle of the Revolutionary War. It is that classic double envelopment that every commander wishes they can have in any battle. Well, Morgan's able to pull it off. And so pretty much all of for, uh, uh, Tarleton's army is either killed or captured. Now, for a second time, another third of Cornwallis' army is, heading, is prisoner and heading up into North Carolina. That's half his army. Uh, so he has to figure out, I have to do something. And what he has to do, he has to go to North Carolina to get those men back. And this was Green's plan. Suck him into North Carolina where he'll be so far away from his supply base, he'll be Burgoyne, like Burgoyne was at Saratoga. Well, he does that. And he keeps sucking him in and sucking him in. And as Cornwallis goes in North Carolina, he keeps begging loyalists in North Carolina to rise up join the cause, join the flag. They're not going to do it because last time they did, they got their ass handed to them. They tried to actually, they, I take it back. They tried to, and some of them start marching toward the camp, but
but they're discovered in the middle of the night and they end up, it's, it's called Piles Massacre. So, you know, it's not a really good fight when you have massacre attached to it. So they all get chopped up. And because of that, the loyalists don't rise up anymore. Well, in that area, not until the Tory war. Now, um, Cornwallis is a very good commander. Even though he's constantly outnumbered, he wins. So he wins the Battle of Guilford Courthouse. And I think that picture behind your head right there, that's the Battle of Guilford Courthouse. Um, I always call the Battle of Guilford Courthouse the Super Bowl of the Revolutionary War because you had the best versus the best. Because in your picture behind your head, that's the first Maryland. And they were the, the most veteran experienced unit probably in the Continental Army. These guys have been through everything. Facing them, coming across the field right there, are the guards. The guards, you know, those guys that are hand-picked. And so they end up doing this fight where neither side is going to budge, neither side's going to back down. And what finally ends the battle of Guilford Courthouse is Green realizes, okay, I've fought long enough, I can leave now. And he left. Because remember, his whole goal was not to beat Cornwallis, just to keep wearing them down. Now, he wore, at the Battle of Guilford Courthouse, Cornwallis lost so many men that he couldn't fight anymore. He had to find a way to leave. He wasn't beat, but he couldn't fight anymore. Even though it was a victory, uh, oh, in, in the British Parliament, they said another such victory in the war is lost. Now, let's talk about a whole side thing. This is where the Tory War comes into play. Because this is leading, that's right now, I think we're up to 1781. Now, the Tory War is basically a guy called Major Craig. Uh, I'm going to look at my notes over here because I had to do all my homework before the show here. Now, Major, where, where is he? There you go, Major James Craig. James Craig had six companies of the 82nd Regiment, and they take Wilmington. Why? They're going to use the supply base to help Cornwallis when he marches into North Carolina. Now, he takes Wilmington, and while he's there, all the loyalists in the area are kind of pumped up. Hey, we have a guy we can get guns from and food and supplies, and we got a place we can run to in case somebody's after us. So Wilmington becomes this, this loyalist refuge. And in modern day terms, I kind of look at it like think of our war in Afghanistan. Every time the Taliban or Al Qaeda wanted to get away, they'd go to Pakistan and we didn't follow them into Pakistan. Well, Wil Wilmington is, is basically the Pakistan of the war right now because all the loyalists can go there and nothing happens to them. Now, Cornwallis, when he is, well, wins Guilford Courthouse, he has to evacuate and he does a withdrawal down to Wilmington. Now, when he's in Wilmington, he gets re-outfitted and he has to make a decision. Do I go back into South Carolina? But if he does, he has to work through all those partisans under Sumter and under Marion and Davy, and he'll lose so many men. So he says, you know what? I'm going to go north to Virginia. Nothing's happened in Virginia. I'll go to Yorktown and I'll reorganize there to take back South Carolina. So he marches north. And Craig is told, you can now evacuate Wilmington. We don't need you anymore. But Craig says, I've built a rapport with the people here. I think I can use them to seriously do some damage against the Patriots. Let me stay and let me use Wilmington as a base of operations. And the British government let him do it. And so what happens is now all of a sudden you've got a strong point where loyalists do rise up a lot and they have a place to run to an outfit and everything else and so it's just a little part of the war that even i didn't know about until about a year ago now i'm going to shut up right now and let you do it say something or ask a question so i can drink my tea sweet tea it's a southern thing <laughs> no uh and we we've already gotten a bunch of comments on our feed uh, just how what a great synopsis what you just did of of, of all the <clears throat> pain getting up to this point and uh, you're right, this is something, you know, Green heads back down into South Carolina and you eventually have, uh, you know, you got Hopkirk Hill, 96 and Utah Springs and, and up north, of course, you you hear about the, the, the siege of Yorktown. Um, so this is kind of that in between land uh, that, yeah, like you said, uh, I don't think much has been written about it. Um, and, uh, and, and yeah, uh, I, as I said, I don't know that much about it either, but it sounds like and you just discovered it recently. So um... let, let me let me talk about I, I did say I was going to talk about the bias later on. Yeah. All right, here's why you don't know. And, and all your viewers out there, here's why you don't know that much about the South. 
It was pure prejudice and biased. Now, I found this out when I was writing my book. It's like, why hasn't anybody wrote about these things? I mean, Utah Springs, holy cow, Utah Springs, the British lost 90% of their force. It was one of the most bloodiest battles of the war. Hardly anybody even knows about it. Mm-hmm. Um, so you had, you know, the bloodiest battle between that with the French and Americans were involved in, nobody knows about. You got the longest siege of the war in a place called 96. Nobody knows about. Uh, you got the largest defeat in American history until World War II. Charleston, hardly anybody knows about it. Why? What it, historians are lazy. I, I hope I'm not a lazy historian. And what I mean lazy, historians have a bad habit of just writing what the last generation wrote in their own words. They just rehash what the last generation wrote in their own words. It's kind of like Hollywood doing a remake of a movie that's been remade 16 times. And there it's it's not their own. They're not looking at the original sources. They're not actually putting any new information in. It's just rehashed old information. And there's new information out there, but nobody's using it. Well, historians are lazy. They use what the last generation wrote. Well, you keep going back, you keep going back, you keep going back. Most of the Revolutionary War history that you you start at happens around the centennial. Uh, That's where a lot of our myths were created, too. That's where the whole... Uh, you know, you start hearing about uh, uh, Betsy Ross and you know, just stuff, to, 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 total BS. But it starts right around that time because everybody wants to cash in and make a book because it's the centennial. It's the birthday of America, 100 years. So let's write history books. But also, 1876 is only a decade since the North and the South fought each other. North doesn't like the South. Uh, they don't like them at all. We killed a bunch of them and they aren't happy about it. And so... When they did the history, they were biased. They left the South out on purpose. And then when they did that, the next generation, when they wrote, they just didn't write about the South because they had been left out. And so you, you see it start out with a bias. But you know, luckily, as we're now in an age, maybe, maybe, we're, maybe we're actually over the whole Civil War thing by now. Um, you, you start seeing the historians writing more about it. So you're seeing a little bit more of with the books. You know, the Internet has also helped a lot. When it opened up, a lot of records opened up and you're able to talk to each other more freely. The records were always there. Just nobody knew about them. Now you you more freely. So you have that bias because most history books you have Lexington Concord and then you have, you know, uh, Cross and Trenton. And then you have, you know, well, you have Bunker Hill, then Trenton. And then it goes all the way up to Saratoga and then Monmouth and then nothing. Nothing at all for like three years. So the next time you hear anything is Yorktown. It's like, okay, the war didn't stop for three years. It had moved down south, and there was some bloody horrible battles going on. So, yeah, there's a little bit of a bias in the in the historians, but it, it's not the fault of anybody in present day. It's just the lazy historians that just rewrite what old historians wrote, and, and some of the older historians were really prejudiced against the south, and they left them out of the history books. No, yeah, I mean, and, and you're right. I, I feel like typically they... <clears throat> Consider most people think when they think Revolutionary War, they think of that New England centric kind of kind of view of it all. But and you kind of don't get in into the South. And I think also because, yeah, they were forced out. And a lot of this stuff is happening later in the war as well. Um, And I know, you know, we also say, you know, George Washington, he does have kind of a uh, outsized influence in the in the memory of the war as well. Of course, he's not at many of these Southern campaign battles. I feel like he gets. uh, you know, oversized influence as well. Um, but no, that, that's, uh, you know, and I think, you know, recently, uh, you know, and the the movie, The Patriot, uh, probably got <laughs> balls on the- Yeah, uh, spit whatever you say, The Patriot down there. <laughs> <laughs> Here's the irony of that. Uh, me and a handful of other guys, we taught the British Army on The Patriot. We taught them how to be the British Army. And, and we were on set and we actually trained those guys for a month. And they were excellent. They were the best trained. I mean, those guys drilled on drum commands. Those guys were fantastic. And then this German director came along and said it didn't hit his vision of history, and he changed everything. Um, <laughs> and Roland Emmerich. <sighs> so he uh, basically, oh, oh, here's one for your fans, a little bit of inside joke. We didn't like what Roland Emmerich was doing to our history. We actually walked off the set. We didn't finish the movie. So he couldn't get any reenactors or anything to show up. Until he was hiring like junior RTC for the final battle. But 
during the time he kept bugging us because he, you know, he, he wanted this ugly, horrible slaughter that happened in the French and Indian war so that his character would reminisce about it, you know, and it was like, you know, leave us alone. You're, you're already screwing up history now. There was no big slaughter. There wasn't one, you know, we, we kind of like didn't really have a lot going on in the French and Indian war. We had the Cherokee war, but that really wasn't the French and Indian war. So it didn't happen. Finally, he kept bugging us. And one of our guys said, oh, I know of a battle where it's ugly slaughter. Oh, yeah. It's like Fort Wilderness. Fort Wilderness, I mean, it was men and women slaughtered, raped, children bashed against trees. It was horrible. He goes, really? I said, oh, yeah, you put that in your script. And in the movie, sure enough, when Mel Gibson reminisces about the war, it's the Battle of Fort Wilderness. <laughs> you know where Fort Wilderness really is? What? Disney World. <laughs> so basically we told him the place in disney world was the biggest slaughter of the war and it's in the movie so we thought that was kind of funny oh wow okay i didn't know where that <laughs> so there you go inside insider information from the patriot <laughs> very cool um all right so uh so yeah so <clears throat> enough you say they so they did leave this force there in wilmington you have this loyalist base uh so what are they gonna while these two main armies are in virginia and south carolina what is what happens uh in north carolina that what, what is this yeah how does the tory will happen I mean, let me explain how i found this first because i i don't think anybody's written about this all right I, he, I like i said i was special forces i still train special forces i do contracts and there's an, there's an operation down here called robin sage and I don't do anything special. I'm not like a top secret ninja guy. I'm just out there. I'm pretending I'm a bad guy. Somebody has to be the bad guy for them to shoot at. So they hire me to come in with some other guys and play the bad guy. All right. So in between the missions, though, there's a lot of downtime. So we're just sitting around in a camp. We have Wi-Fi. I got a computer. So what I do is I, I keep researching and looking, you know, improving nothing but blood and slaughter. Eventually, I'm going to I say I'm going to come out with a new edition some year, but I keep improving it. Well, mainly I go through first person accounts and there's a really good online site. It's called uh, the, basically it's a, the pensioners uh, of South Carolina. You can, if you just type in a Google search for pension records of South Carolina and North Carolina, you'll see it. It's all, every pension they can find has been transcribed and on that site. So I'm, I'm going through all these pensions of these different things. And I start, start seeing a, a, a phrase the Tory war. And I come along the Tory war. Now look at that one, the Tory war. These guys keep calling something the Tory war. I don't know what the heck that is. So I start reading their accounts and, and I'm, I'm discovering these almost modern techniques. And that's what's uh, the reason I think this is going to be my next book. I'm going to try and write how what they were doing is almost like modern day special forces. For example, they had sniper teams, specialized weapons, shooting, you know, killing guys from almost, uh, you know, 400 yards away, which is a pretty long distance for a black powder rifle uh, from hidden locations. They hid there for a week. They had hunter killer teams that had cards to take out specific targets. They had recon elements that their whole goal was to get in and get out without being seen. You, you have all of these modern day things that we, 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 you know, we think modern, but they're doing it in the Revolutionary War. And this is kind of impressive me how they're doing this. So it all came about by me finding all these first person accounts in the pension records. And so I got enough information where I started piecing together what they were talking about, the Tory war. I said, basically, it starts with Major Craig occupying Wilmington. That's in January of 1781. Well, Cornwallis shows up in April 1781 and tells Craig, you don't have to stay here anymore. Follow me to Yorktown. But then Craig asked his higher, his, his superiors, if he can stay. And they say yes. Now, what Craig does, I'm going to be looking over here at my notes. Like I said, I had to do a little homework before it starts. About May of 1781 is when the phrase Tory War starts rising up. You see it. So May of 1781, what is happening is all these loyalists rise up and are starting to strike back. And we're not talking like ones or two. We're talking about bands of like three and 400 guys doing raids. And they're almost all mounted. Hard, everything down here is mounted. I mean, you're, you ain't going to be in this fight if you ain't got a horse. Everybody was mounted. Uh, they would ride, hit them right away. Now, uh, one of the really, really effective loyalist partisans is a guy called David Fanning. Now, Fanning 
if the British had actually won the war, Fanning would be a place that counties and schools would be named after him. Nerds, he was the British version of Francis Marion. He's just as good. And actually, I think he's better than Francis Marion. It's kind of sacrilege talk down here. But uh, I think he does a better job. But because the British lost, you don't know that much about him. Now, Fanning starts out small. He's raiding Patriot supply lines. But he's so effective that all of a sudden some Patriot groups rise up and try to take him down. And so what you're seeing is it's now uh, little ambushes, little fights. But some of these little ambushes end up becoming just incredibly bloody. Uh, A good example is uh, there was a a group of people, uh, Patriots, were coming back from a mission. And they get on a ferry. And as they're on a ferry, there's this girl there, and they're harassing the girl. And in their firsthand accounts, it says that they stole her cloth. About the, I think what they did was women would, you know, find a nice piece of cloth that they would plan to make a wedding dress out of. And I think that's what they stole. Anyway, they stole it from her. And in the area, the loyalist militia are all angered because they did this to this girl. So they rise up from a place called Long Street Church. Long Street Church is smack dab in the middle of Fort Bragg right now. It's still there. The church, you can Google that one, Long Street Church. And uh, uh, it's, it's, it still exists. There's all the stones are there. But Long Street Church was a loyalist church. Right up close to where I live is Barbecue Church. It was actually called Barbecue Church in the 18th century. So I live in Barbecue Church Township right now in North Carolina. Now, Barbecue Church was all loyalist. I mean, you you were no patriots here. Well, the guys, uh, the the loyalists were uh, basically rising up in these churches and decide to take out. Um, hold it, I just made a big mistake. <sighs> Barbecue Church is all patriot. I'm got my brain working sideways. So Long Street Church is loyalist. Barbecue Church is patriot. And the two churches were basically against each other. So it's two church congregations that hate each other's guts. Now, the guys who stole the girl's cloth, they were basically from Barbecue Church. Well, Long Street Church rises up middle of the night, tracks these guys down. And where they got them was, is, uh, let me look around here real quick. Uh, da, da, da. Oh, man, I'm trying to, my notes I know what I've got wrong. There we go. I'm going to move my notes up. Uh, yeah, let's, let's call it, we're going to call it something, something massacre because it's going to be a massacre no matter what you do. Anyway, they hit these guys in the middle of the night. They end up killing like about seven of them. But one of the ones they kill is a kid who's on a wagon. They literally cut him in half with a sword because it's dark. You don't know it's a kid. You're just chopping and hiking and slashing. Well, now all of a sudden, the Patriots are angered because these loyalists attacked them in their camp and killed the kid for the next two weeks in that area. There is nothing but gang warfare. It's like drive-by shootings. There's there's they're killing each other's loyalists. They're killing each other's Patriots ends up 14 people dead in a two week period, mainly killed on their doorsteps by being gunned down. And then finally the leader who the Patriot leader ends up being gunned down on his own doorstep. But that's the brutal, bloody stuff you're seeing going on with the Tory war. Normally, the Tories wouldn't rise up. They would not you know, come forth because they didn't have any support. Now, if anybody's chasing and pursuing them, they can go to Wilmington. And also, if they lose people, they can go to Wilmington and get more. Wilmington is the uh, basically safe place for them to go to. Now, Craig gives an ultimatum. He's tired of all this fighting. He says, everybody in North Carolina, in my area on the eastern coast, everybody has to swear loyalty to the king by the 1st of August, or else I'm going to you know, come down and punish you. Well, they don't. So he does the punitive expedition. He marches over to New Bern, ends up burning people down, capturing a bunch of high dignitaries. Then he goes to Kinston, burning people down, catching high dignitaries. And as he's doing this, more and more loyalists come in. So he's getting even bigger armies. The only reason he stops is he is told that Mad Anthony Wayne is about to come south and fight him. So he quickly goes to Wilmington. Turns out Wayne was coming south, but he stops at Yorktown and helps out at Yorktown instead. Now, let's talk about some of the 
like I said, the, the, the sniper mission, this is, this is wild in its own right. The sniper mission was a guy called Ter- Colonel Thomas Bloodworth. That's a good name for you. His, his friend had been killed. Craig had basically found a, a tavern that was kind of like a safe house. So he surrounds the tavern and kills everybody inside in the middle of the night. It's a nighttime strike, kick in doors, like, again, like modern day warfare. It's a night going on, but with bayonets and muskets. Well, his friend gets killed. Well, he decides to get revenge. So he builds, Bloodworth is a, he's a colonel, but he's also a gunsmith. He builds a special rifle. Now, the exact caliber of this rifle, I think I figured it was about an 80 caliber. And it was pretty long. So it's almost like a wall gun. But think of a wall gun that's rifled. Now, the other thing he does is he he hunts in his area is around Wilmington. So on the opposite side of Wilmington, on the other side of the Cape Fear River, on one of these days when he's hunting, he finds a sycamore tree. And it's huge, but it's hollowed out on the inside because it had died and hollowed out. But the outer layer is still there. But you could stand inside that tree, literally hold your arms out and not touch the sides. It's that big. So he decides, I'm going to use this tree as a base. So he gets his son and his friend, and they go there and they build scaffold inside the tree to firing ports. They drill holes in the tree. They also drill more holes so the smoke can dissipate so you can't see it. And Wilmington Harbor is about 400 yards away. So you got this 400-yard shot with an 80 caliber rifle. On the 4th of July, 1781, the British soldiers are lining up. You had nothing better to do. On their, if they're not on guard duty, they ain't got nothing better to do right now. So they line up to get there at a liquor store, for the lack of a better word. As they're in line, Bloodworth fires. Boom, takes down one dude. Everybody's like, what the hell is that? And they're just standing there. They don't know what that is. He fires. Boom, takes down a second guy. Now they're freaking out, running around circles, trying to figure out what's going on. That's it, though. Bloodworth stumps. Now they've built hammocks inside that sycamore tree to actually sleep and stay there. So they don't do any more shooting. The British don't know where the shots came from. They can't imagine it came from across the river. But the next day, same thing happens. Boom, he kills two people and then backs off. Now the British do search. They go to across the river and search. They can't find it because that tree is, is, is pretty well concealed and they're inside it. They don't think about looking inside a tree. Blood work keeps us up for 10 days, sniping and killing people for 10 days. Finally, they do discover his tree, but by then he's able to get away. So that's this sniper mission that, I mean, you know, this is kind of like, uh, like almost like a modern day sniper mission. Another one, I talked about the hunter killer teams. In Vietnam, we had um, a pretty secret thing. You know about it now. I mean, it, 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 you can read about it and it was called, uh, what was it called? Uh, oh man, I, I can't, I can't remember, but it was basically it was an assassination campaign where we had guys that would go in, find the high level Viet Cong leaders in their villages and kill them in the middle of the night and then go away and maybe leave a card or something to let you know who did it. But it was a secret mission. Well, in the Red War, you had a guy who came up with that. Uh, let me find his name. I got all these notes. I can't find anything. I guess I need to remember how to write better notes, huh? Uh, where are we? Yeah. Oh, there. Colonel Robert Mabane. There's a there's a town in North Carolina called Mebane. It's named after him. Anyway, he forms these teams to go track down specific Tory leaders and eliminate them any way possible. You can get them and get back. But they're 10 man groups, which I also thought was interesting because a modern day A team is a 12 man unit. But uh, if you take away the officer and the XO, it's 10 men. So there's 10 men specialized teams going around trying to find these loyalists and kill them in the middle of the night, whenever. And so they're pretty successful. He also sends out recon elements. Their main job is to be, it's called a company of spies. So it's like modern day LERPs. So he's doing that. The only reason this ended was Mabin is himself killed when he goes and visits his home. He's killed by a guy on the side of the road. Uh, all this is going on. You also have Fanning. Like I said, he's an excellent loyalist commander. He does some wild missions. One of his missions, he actually raids the, the, the basically the capital of North Carolina at the time, and he captures the governor of North Carolina. So he captures them, takes them back to Wilmington, gives them the Craig, 
there's a huge battle called the Battle of Lindley's Mill trying to get the governor back before he can deliver it to Wilmington, but it, they're not able to do it. And so, you know, uh, Fanning is able to pull that off. So he's able to get in and get out constantly. And like I said, he does things that I think are even better than what Marion did. Now, what ends the Tory war, this constant thing is finally, it's mainly because Cornwallis gets captured at Yorktown. When Cornwallis gets captured at Yorktown, pretty much the British in the South realize that they're on their own and their days are numbered. And so they tell everybody, pull back. So Craig is ordered to pull out, um, get, you know, go and, and leave, evacuate Wilmington. So the only reason the whole Tory war ends is because of the capture of Cornwallis. But it's one of the few successful loyalist uh, counter insurgency movements, counterinsurgency depends on which side you're on, I guess. But you know, whenever you read the history books, it talks about how the loyalists never really rose up in North Carolina. Well, yeah, they did. Between May and October of 1781, they were forced to be reckoned with. I mean, they were winning constantly, and they were doing it very well. And they uh, they're they're going to be what happens to them after. Uh... After the British pull out, do many loyalists leave with them or how many of them stick around and what's their fate, I guess? Well, here's here's a problem. I know up north you had loyalists and you had guys, depending on what, what army was marching through the city, they had a different flag flying from their window. Um, down south, we're talking, you know, about half and half. I know the one quote that said a third of the people were for the British, a third of the people were for the Americans, and a third wanted to stay out of it. And I know that quote's not from the Revolutionary War, but still, they, everybody always used that. In the Carolinas, no, it's pretty much half and half. Half the country was for loyalists, and half the country was for the patriots, and there was hardly anybody that was sitting on the fence. Because once you get your house burned down or your, your, your relatives killed, you ain't on the fence anymore. So you couldn't punish all the loyalists. They outnumbered you. I mean, like where I live right now, Barbecue Township, uh, this was uh, almost on the edge of Loyalist territory because I said, you know, you go into Fort Bragg, that's Loyalist. Right here, it's Patriot. But this whole section of that area was Loyalist. So you can't punish them all. And so they realized that. What do, you, what do you do when you lose all these Loyalists? When do you say it's over? All right, check this out. I did a, a contract in Sierra Leone. And I always, always said I could put on my resume. I was a mercenary for the Catholic Church. I thought that sounded cool. But what it was is I was, me and a buddy of mine were guarding this, this rich guy and this Catholic priest because they were helping rebuild uh, hospitals and, and churches in Sierra Leone. And the war in Sierra Leone was brutal. I mean, it is one of the most bloodiest civil wars in Africa. And that's modern history here. Well, when I went there, you would think everybody would have a chip on their shoulder, but what it was, everybody had been through so much killing. Nobody wanted to do it. It was like a, a national PTSD. Nobody wanted to do any more killing. They didn't want more killing. They were done with killing. And I think that probably reached the point. Now there was still, I mean, the killing did go on. There was blood feuds that went on after the war, but Overall, most people realize you just can't keep killing each other. The war is over. You got to stop. We've killed enough. Uh, guys like Fanning. Fanning is one of the few that was not allowed to stay. Uh, and under the, 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 the basically one of the evacuations orders, uh, they were trying to make agreements with the Brits, but they said there's, you know, there's four people. We're not going to allow stay. And if we get them, we're going to kill them. Fanning was one of them. Um, Fanning wasn't like a bloody guy. He really didn't need to do anything too brutal, but he was just so effective. He's not going to be able to stay. So Fanning and a handful of loyalists, they went to Florida. And when Florida, at the end of the war, they went from Florida and most of them ended up up in Canada around Nova Scotia and Halifax. So a, a, hand, a, a good chunk of the loyalists that did not want to stay, they went up to Canada or they, you know, by way of Florida. There are parts of Canada today that really got a chip on their shoulder against the United States because they're those descendants from those guys. They're not real thrilled about the United States. Uh, but most of the loyalists stayed, and they actually had peace. I mean, it, it's it's like I said, it's like the comparison to Sierra Leone, where, yeah, you killed all these people, but at what point do you say we're done killing? 
you know, you got to have peace. Yeah, man. Oh, I, I will say this one more thing. Part of that was Francis Mary. Uh, South Carolina was trying to do, a, you know, coming up with a plan to punish the loyalists and take all their property. And Francis Miriam had well, you know, a pretty good reputation. And so he went there and said, no, we're not going to punish these guys. And if you do, I won't be part of your, your, your government anymore. I'll, I'll resign. And so he had a big say so in this because uh, it was thanks to him. It's kind of like at the end of the civil war, when Robert E. Lee told his men, it's time to surrender. You can't keep fighting. If he hadn't have said that, many of them would have gone up the mountains and kept fighting. But because Robert E. Lee said it, they backed down. Well, same thing with Francis Marion. Because he said it, they kind of backed down from punishing the loyalists. Mm -hmm. And that must be, I mean, that's a really, the, the ending of this is always overlooked, I think. That's got to be difficult for people to uh, put down their weapons. But like you said, you know, you and for years on end of this kind of bitter warfare that it's got to be exhausting. Um but anyways, uh, yeah, we've gone over time here, but um, we'll definitely have to have you back here at some point. You're obviously a wealth of knowledge, know a whole lot uh, about this campaign. And um, uh, we're looking forward to hopefully you uh, 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 writing that book on the Tory war here at some point. But if people want to follow you or want to get a copy of your book or anything else like that, how can people uh, get that? Uh what basically all my books are on amazon any any online bookseller so if you type in nothing but blood and slaughter it'll come up uh the francis marion's orderly book the name of that was uh be cool and do mischief but uh you might be able to find it if you just type in francis marion's orderly book and, and a side plug like i said i wrote a book about three things i did in my life it's called triple canopy now bad news is if you go to amazon and you would search for triple canopy you get these like dozen romance novels with half naked seals on, on it. Uh, that's not me. I keep going down till you find one little black cover with a special force patch on it. That one's mine. But ba mainly any online bookseller, you can find nothing but blood and slaughter and, uh, and the Francis Marion book. And also when you spell my name, many times people try to search my name and they don't find it because they're misspelling my name. It's O apostrophe K E L L E Y. If you type just the Y, you end up with a guy called Patrick O'Kelly, who's a, priest and he writes children's books <laughs> all right well important uh a change there but um thank you very much patrick for joining us uh we'll be back on uh, in two weeks where we'll be talking more about nathaniel green and a uh a historical fiction book uh, that recently come out about him um but uh thanks for joining us and everybody i hope has a happy washington's birthday weekend uh thanks for joining us patrick not a problem